Hello and welcome to The Contrarians, where we're right and you're wrong. I'm Alex. I'm Julio, and thank you for listening. If you like what you hear, head over to Apple Podcasts to subscribe and leave us a five-star review. Help promote the algorithm and spread the word. You can also find us on SoundCloud to subscribe and review. And don't forget to visit our main website, wearethecontrarians.com. Follow us on Twitter at Contrarian Prime. And to like us on Facebook, visit facebook.com slash Contrarian Prime. And if you have the willpower to keep up with our pretentious ramblings, you can follow us individually at Contrarian Alex for myself and at Ovnio for Julio. That's O-V-N-I-O. Now, time for the podcast. All right, I am recording for Contrarian's Corner for Tango and Cash. Hello, and welcome back to The Contrarians, where we're right and you're wrong. My name is Alex. I am joined, as always, by my co-host and friend, Julio. Julio, it is the dead center of April in the year 2021, and while I have lost all track of time, motivation, and self-respect, I have found myself uh, stumbling into a wonderful addition to Contrarian's canon with uh, our most recent uh, Patreon episode here as we bring on to the Contrarian's for the first time, Andre Konchalovsky. And if I remember correctly, this would be Terry Hatcher's Contrarian's debut as well? Yes, it is. Because I was very excited that I wrote down her name on my notes. Lois Lane herself has graced us with her presence. <laughs> yes, this is the Contrarians. And Julio, I, as you can tell, I'm already excited. I'm getting ahead of myself here as uh, to what we're covering today. Let's get the, the customaries out of the way. How are you doing late on this Thursday evening? I'm doing I'm doing good. It's been if if any of you follow me on on Twitter, not on the Contrarians account, but on my personal account. Uh, well, by now you probably don't remember because this episode is coming out at the end of the month. But uh, I had I had a rough day yesterday, just just busy and uh, a lot of things not going quite the the proper way. And then the ship righted itself today, probably around the time that I pressed play on Tango and Cash. And from then on, <laughs> smooth sailing. Uh, so I'm doing I'm doing good. It's it's getting hot. That's my main complaint now that's the whole thing about time just like dissipating during this whole pandemic every day kind of feels the same because we're just kind of doing the same thing every day and then some days it'll be raining and kind of cold and then like looking at the calendar and saw it was the beginning of april was like shit and it's hit 90 already (laughs) a few times in the past two weeks so it's ramping up but before you know it you know we'll be able to go swim in the pool and hang out outside and whatnot I, I have a question that must be asked before we even get into the quotes and the, the contrarian's corner or real talk or anything. And it is just honestly look into your soul. Are you a tango or are you a cash? And, oh, I'm definitely a cash. Okay, I was I was afraid that 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 would make me the tango. It, that sucks, but it makes sense. <laughs> It does not suck. Tango lives a more respectable life. I like. I'm just kind of a slobbingly piece of shit. For the record, <laughs> I am not comparing my looks to that of 1989 Kurt Russell. But it, like, I live a bit more of a clean life than his apartment. But his whole demeanor is the word I was searching for there. And you know, tattered rags that he throws on his back as clothing. I can't shoot a gun like he does, um, <laughs> or take a bullet. And, uh, yeah, like you. He does. You have the more dignified, uh, I think it's a S- Smith & Wesson, the the small the little pea shooter that he's got, the six shooter. Yeah, so nothing wrong with being a, a tango. You wear the Armani suits while I'm over here, you know, <laughs> hounding out tail. That's kind of what we do. I just don't think that uh, growing up, any kids wanted to be tango. I think everybody wanted to be cash. Well, that's the thing. Like, people who grow up want to be tango. I still haven't grown up. <laughs> I'm nearly 34 and just still content with what I what my life is. Um, you said press play. Did we both watch this the same way? Did you watch this on Tubi? I did. I did. Commercials included to give it that that full 80s vibe. Oh, absolutely. And you know, I've been watching a lot of Peacock recently, and I just got the the entry level membership there, so I've kind of become accustomed to commercials every once in a while. When we were watching WrestleMania, Reed was giving me shit about not having the premium version because you have the premium version there's no commercials but it's, it's twice the money it's five bucks or ten bucks it's a principal thing it's a principal smoky so yeah Tubi, man that's coming clutch 
for our <laughs> podcast and also just in my personal life. They have such a strange library. Yep. It's just basically like the land of misfit toys that they just acquire <laughs> movies whose, you know, distribution or uh, streaming rights kind of fall through the cracks. And in this case, both you and I got to watch uh, Tango and Cash for free and it, it looks sparkling. So if this is your first time listening to The Contrarians, we'd greatly appreciate you taking the time to do so. If you're a returning listener, we appreciate you all the same. Give us a moment here while we explain our gimmick to the the newbies, the first timers. Here on The Contrarians, we like to rage against the Rotten Tomatoes machine, as we say. We like to find a movie on Rotten Tomatoes that is highly rated, a lot of times known as certified fresh. Uh, what we'll do then is make a case for maybe some of the, the negative aspects of it, and maybe why the critics got it wrong. Conversely, we'll find a movie on Rotten Tomatoes that is uh, lowly rated, usually about 30% and below, uh, those gr- nasty green splotches known as rotten, and we'll make a case for the film's positive merit and maybe uh, some of the ways in which it was misunderstood. Being that Tango and Cash is right at 30% on Rotten Tomatoes, we will be arguing for this movie's merit and its place in not only 80s but buddy cop uh, lore. Julio, if listeners wanted to know how we really feel about the movie, though, they just have to hang around in the second half. That's correct. Stick around for real talk, the second half of the show, where we express our real feelings. We are no longer tied to the gimmick of Contrarian's Corner. In real talk, we just tell you exactly how we feel about the movie, and we tell each other how we feel about the movie. In this case, for example, right before we started recording, Alex said, Julio, I think I know how you feel about this, even though I haven't even texted him about the movie. Maybe he does. I don't know. I guess we'll find out in, in, in real talk. This is a bonus episode. It doesn't fall in our you know numeric or chronological episodes. Uh, this comes to us from one of our patrons who threw Tango and Cash our way. Uh, Jamie Russell, to be fair, he, he threw a whole bunch of options our way. Uh, he did give us a, an option, a, a litany of options, I should say. Yes. Uh, and so so he he put it out there and then we ourselves snatched it and said, this one, we'll do this one. I don't really remember our reasoning. I mean, I think primarily because neither of us had seen it, but also, I mean, I didn't know Terry Hatcher was in it. That would have been also a reason to do it. (laughs) Knowing of this movie to a point of cliche and having never seen it, I thought, yeah, that'd be cool. I'm always down for an 80s movie with Sylvester Stallone, especially in this context, because I can be facetious about it when necessary. So thanks for the recommendation. We'll get to this in the second portion. We'll get to whether or not we're truly appreciative of it or not. But one thing that is unwavered is our appreciations for our patrons. So thank you very much. If you want more information on our Patreon, stick around to the second half. We'll give you the whole breakdown of it. Now we go back to Christmas time of 1989. Julio, could you believe it? It was a Christmas movie, December 22nd. (laughs) I believe it because it was the eighties. When I saw that, I was like, of course it was. That, that makes perfect sense. December 22nd of 1988, the aforementioned Andre uh, Konchalovsky. Andre, I apologize if I'm butchering your last name there. Uh, I believe of the Soviet Union. Yeah, he worked in the Soviet because the early portion of his career was a lot of films for the Soviet Union. That explains the, the prominence of the Russian elements in, in the movie. <laughs> I work with what you know. Stick with what you know. Yeah, for 20 years, he directed and wrote films that uh originated in the soviet union the U- ussr that's fascinating sylvester stallone this is, a, this is his robocop this is <laughs> this is his robocop uh sylvester stallone once again returning the contrarians kurt russell who got top billing i didn't even see their I names s- come up on the on the thing i assume sly he was the uh, first featured on the poster he was the academy award winner of the two at the time <laughs> but also i mean I don't think Kurt Russell, I love Kurt Russell, but he, he's never had a Rocky, right? I mean, he's, he's just a well-known actor with a whole bunch of movies that we all love under his belt. But I wouldn't say that there's an iconic Kurt Russell vehicle. Am I wrong? That's fair. Okay. Overboard? No, that, that's a, <laughs> that, that's a, a fair statement to make. Despite the fact that with a budget of $54 million, it returned a box office uh, grab of $120 million. <laughs> So definitely earned back what uh, what was put in and then some. Despite that fact and this movie's kind of notable reputation, and I don't even know if I'd call it cult-like status. It's just kind of one of those uh, cliche 80s movies, you know, the buddy cop, as we mentioned earlier, genre that people uh, go to quite often. Despite all that, 30% on Rotten Tomatoes. People did not care for this movie. They were not kind to it. Uh, Julio, what were they saying about this? 
So we're going to do some uh, rotten quotes from the Rotten Tomatoes website on this half, and then on Real Talk, we'll grab some of the rare fresh quotes. Uh, but let's start with Desmond Ryan from the Philadelphia Inquirer, who says, Both men think that the best way to deliver the right to remain silent to the usual suspects is via a right hook. Okay. I mean, what's wrong with that? <laughs> Especially because it was the 80s. Uh, I fail to see uh, the uh, the connection. How, here. how is that wrong? Uh, Dave Kerr from the Chicago Tribune says the film looks like the sort of queasy fever dream that might be produced by sitting through an entire Orson Welles film festival while eating pepperoni pizzas. Again, that sounds like a fantastic time. Yeah, what, what's the problem? <laughs> An Orson Welles marathon while eating pepperoni pizzas. That's that's a fresh. No matter which way you look at it. Sergio Benitez from Spinoff says that Tango and Cash was an undeserved testament to the action cinema of the 80s is evidence that the implacable judge called time has revealed in a more than painful way. I think he's using a lot of big words to say that the movie's dated, which it's an 80s movie. And in a way, those are timeless. And then finally, Chris Hicks from Desert News, Salt Lake City Movies like this are annoying because they seem to be saying that the audience is made up of morons. Do you agree with Again. that, Alex? Because I don't think so. <laughs> I think that the movie is saying that the people in the movie are morons. Uh, yeah, but to be fair, if even that's their take, then maybe not 1989, but by today's standards, they're definitely correct. The movie going public are stupid, so you should probably treat them like that. <laughs> that's your best way to go. To be fair, the American population at large is stupid. They elected Donald Trump president once and almost a second time. So there you go. They're dumb whether they go to the movies or not. (laughs) Exactly. Uh, I was trying to find here what Ebert and Siskel, Siskel and Ebert had to say about it, but all I could really find, I mean, I found the episode where they reviewed it, but Ebert said it was a mess, which is rude. (laughs) So who's Tango, who's Cash there? I would have to say Siskel would be your Tango and (laughs) Ebert would be Cash. You know, Ebert was definitely a little bit more the bad boy. Julio, Tango and Cash, my first note here just says, hell yeah, immediate action. There's no time for you to adjust or get anything approaching board. As we begin here with Tango, Sylvester Stallone chasing down um, famed cult actor Robert Zadar, who is uh, known for Manic Cop and also his role in Samurai Cop. He uh, is the gentleman with the enlarged jawline, which I thought had to be some sort of cosmetic surgery, but that's actually due to a condition he had. Cherubism, uh, for anyone of that condition, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing it, but that immediately was very distinguishable. And right off the bat, he's the bad guy, slides the good guy, car chase, takes out his gun, starts shooting at this fucking 18-wheeler. It's action right off the bat. They don't make them like they used to, Alex. Now they have to give you a. They have to catch you up on what happened in the last five movies in the franchise, and then <laughs> they have to give you a montage, kind of like showing you where everybody is now, and then thirty minutes later the story can start. Not here, and also Sylvester Stallone with glasses, which already I'm in. Never seen it. His real glasses. I found out that he typically wore contacts, but those were the ones he actually wore. We see right away his trademark gun, which is, I mentioned that Smith & Wesson. It's a uh, kind of like a mini revolver, but it does inflict a hell of a lot of damage. He gets these two perps. One of them says, fuck me or something like that. And Sly (laughs) says, I prefer prefer blondes. I can't remember the exact exchange of dialogue, but (laughs) But again. Remember the the tone, (laughs) the performance. (laughs) Even if you're under the assumption that this might be a fun family action movie, one of the first lines of dialogue lets you know that you're you're in for, you know, put the kids to bed. This is going to be <laughs> – this isn't Rocky. This is Sly like you've never seen him before. I would, I would argue, Alex, just let the, let the kids watch it. This is <laughs> – They need to see what real life is like. Yeah, exactly. They need real role models. He stopped this car out of his jurisdiction. We learned that Tango is one of the leading cops. He's a lieutenant with the LAPD. He's kind of out in the, the desert and, of course – I don't know if there's ever been a single movie that has painted Highway Patrolman in a good light. And it certainly didn't start (laughs) or uh, continue with Tango and Cash because they just seem like true assholes. And they're outsmarted because they think that he apprehended this truck with no reason and shoots out the side and starts pouring cocaine. Uh, He knew better than they did because, like I said, 
we always have to paint highway patrolmen as absolute morons so that no one respects them in real life. So all they really do is just pull over people for going five miles over the speed limit. It's the, it's the natural order of things in life. Uh, I think that on top of all that, the sequence makes sure that you know which movie you're watching, what kind of movie you're watching, because they have this classic, I'm assuming, exchange. I had, I'd never heard it before, but when we announced that we were doing this, this movie on Twitter, uh, a bunch of people quoted it back <laughs> on Twitter to us, uh, which is that one of the highway patrolmen goes, he thinks it's Rambo, and then Stallone goes, Rambo's a pussy. And then he looks at the camera and winks. Classic self-awareness from Sly here. Gotta love it. If if by now you don't get what kind of movie you're in, which is that, you know, it's let's have fun. Let's have fun with 80s tropes. It, it, they could tell that the decade was coming to an end. And soon enough, soon enough that fucker Cobain was going to ruin everything. But <laughs> oh, That Cobain <laughs> pussy had to come along and ruin it all. Yes. <laughs> But for a couple more years, they can get away with just extreme violence and just insensitive humor and lots of quips. I think that it's it's just like an end of the decade celebration of the eighties, and, and this is this is right in tone with that. It's really funny you put it that way. Um, one of the quotes I read about it was um, they said it was the last film before irony was created. <laughs> it was a it was a review that praised the movie for. You know, kind of its tongue-in-cheek charm. I just imagine, though, with, you know, now how we know how seriously Stallone takes himself. Just uh, (laughs) who wrote it? Randy Feldman, the writer of it, just feeding him that line and waiting for him to say something back to him. It's like, what are you going to do about it? You going to do something about it? Go out there. You call yourself a pussy because we're paying you to do that. Now go, you bitch. (laughs) Stallone would ask for a rewrite where his response was like, uh, no, Rambo. Rambo's awesome. And then he would shoot the guy. <laughs> yeah. He would just be like, that guy's a hero. Let's get out of my way. <laughs> Take in the sly comedy all you want because we see the bad guy pull up along the crime scene here in a fucking limo. It's Jack Palance <laughs> as Eve's parrot, the crime lord of Southern California. Academy Award winner. And man, you want to talk about someone who looks like they're having a good time with what they're doing. That is Jack Palance in this movie. He's accompanied by, um, I guess, he's like the head of the crime scene in the area. And then there's um, Quan and Lopez, who are kind of crime bosses that run their their respective syndicates. I believe Quan is with the triads. And, and Lopez is a crime boss from his uh, running his own operation. James Hong plays Quan. My notes say Cassandra's dad, because that's who's Cassandra's dad in Wayne's World. How it's always going to be. So wait, so who's the, sorry, Mister Hong? Who's the British guy? He was not in the limo. He, not that I saw. He might have been sitting next to Jack Palance, but that was um, Brian James, who played Requin, Parrot's ponytailed Cockney henchman, who couldn't decide if he was Australian or British with the way he was weaving in and out of his accents throughout it. But, you know, that's a discussion for a different time. Did you think he looked like uh, the guy from Saw? A little bit. I can see that. It's a good call. Yeah, and he was a... Brian James was an American character actor, so <laughs> I I just don't think he did enough studying of his accent in this one because it was not up to snuff. But, hey, we'll get to that later. So now we know Tango. It's time to meet Cash. As Kurt Russell pulls up in his car, he... For whatever reason, he's like fucking Ali and Zaire. All these children are gathered around his car and following him and just like throwing their hands in the air. And I don't know if they're chanting for him or what they're doing, but they're clearly happy. Yeah. Kurt Russell is for the kids. And this is where we see it. He like pulls into his garage and lowers his garage door. And I actually thought like one of the kids was going to get sandwiched in it. It was (laughs) it was all so much happening at once. I mean, what an entrance to make. You're clearly a good cop in this situation when children are just following your vehicle chanting for you. It's like Hulk Hogan's parade at Disney when he signed with WCW. <laughs> so if Stallone is playing against type, uh, I'm assuming he is. I mean, I've, I honestly, as much as I know of Stallone as a pop culture figure, I'm really not not that well versed in his filmography beyond, you know, I know he's, he's Rocky, he's Rambo, he isn't Expendables. So just going by that, I mean, to me, when he's playing the uptight cop that's always dressed in a suit, that has the classy gun, and the glasses, you know, he's playing against type. Whereas uh, Kurt Russell, I think he's doing the, the opposite. I mean, Kurt Russell is is completely embracing what I imagine was the Kurt Russell persona in the 80s. 
uh, in a way he's doubling down on it right he's he's a he's a fun oh, cop yeah. he's a i mean it's not just that the kids think he's cool but he he thinks he's cool he's <laughs> the entire time he's just strutting around and and uh, the movie agrees, obviously, because in, in this introduction, he gets shot twice. <laughs> and the movie takes a sweet 20 minutes before revealing that uh, the reason that he's not dead is because he had a bulletproof vest underneath. Like, most movies would put you at ease right away. But this movie is like, you know it's Kurt Russell, he'll be okay. He's just that cool. Our introductions to both the titular characters result in fucking action scenes. That is what you need in a goddamn action movie. Not just like this introduction. Yeah, we get quickly that Stallone is the more proper of the two and more, you know, defined by the books. But still, we meet him because he's in a high speed chase where he shoots these guys out of a fucking 18 wheeler. And here, awesome camera work where it's, you know, (laughs) Kurt Russell checking himself out in the mirror and then a gun comes through it from the other side and this uh, Asian hitman's trying to take him out. And yeah, they get into a chase and Russell eventually takes him down and. Turns him in at the station. He gets shot twice, Alex. <laughs> he does. But, you know, he, he survives it because he's got a bulletproof vest. It's like, uh, just like you said, you know he's not going to die. It's like in The Dark Knight when Gary Oldman gets shot by the Joker. It's like, oh, that's sad. But you know he's not dead. It's Gary Oldman. He's not going to go anywhere. Yeah, but th- I think that it's just, it's it's crazy how it underlines the difference in filmmaking between, you know, the end of the 80s and now. Where now you know that the filmmakers would need to reassure you. They would, they would include a shot, a brief shot of Kurt Russell kind of like tearing his shirt off and showing that the, the vest is there before the, the rest of the shootout continued. But here, no, it's just, he's alive. That's all that matters. Yeah, eventually we see the bulletproof vest with the, you know, the bullets still kind of lodged in it. But you got to keep up, man. Tango nor Cash is going to hold your hand through this. They'll hold each other's hands. They will. Speaking of holding something, a young Terry Hatcher (laughs) appears. And this is kind of where we get an insight more to the professionalism of Tango. Terry Hatcher's in his office talking about leaving the country because she wants to go dance. Something to that effect. And, you know, he's a bit apprehensive. He clearly there's a relationship between the two and he's protective of her and, you know, wants to make sure that she's um, she's safe wherever she's going. He asks for like a phone number and she says, I'll call you. She's clearly a free spirit. But Julio, were you was it clear to you that she was going to be the female lead of this movie? Uh, I sure hope so. I didn't know if this was just a little bit of color that we were getting for for the tango character and. It just, you know, I didn't know at what point in her career we were getting Lois Lane here. I mean, obviously before the new adventures of Superman, but but was this before or before after Seinfeld. Her, her cameo in Fraser? Uh, I, I don't know. You know, I was like, was this like a big break? Was was this like a cute, uh, a cute scene that she was doing a favor to uh, to Stallone, or or what? I didn't know. And so I was glad that she came back later. No, my question to you, Alex, is: Did you fall for? the trickery of the filmmakers here did you assume that stallone was talking to his girlfriend uh kind of at the same time there was clearly a separation in their relationship where if my immediate thought was if this is his girlfriend man she really doesn't give a fuck (laughs) she's like she's not in this for the long haul she's just trying to get some space from him so they did a good job of making me second guess I mean spoiler for anyone that hasn't seen the movie come to find out that uh, Terry Hatcher's character uh, Catherine Kiki is actually uh, Tango's sister so this introductory scene it seems like there's a relationship between the two but in my opinion the writing of the movie and the the performances here by uh, Stallone and Hatcher respectively did such a good job of making the viewer guess. Yeah, I I, I agree. I, I felt a little more for it. I, I thought that I was watching a couple that was towards the end of the relationship because yeah, there's really not much of a, there's no physicality. <laughs> there's no, you know, no, no kiss hello or no kiss goodbye or anything. It's just kind of a, it feels like the the fire has died in that relationship. If it were to be a romantic relationship, which once you find out that they're siblings, then it makes perfect sense. Yeah, I'm with you. And, and I was just I was just so glad to see her. I mean, you don't see Terry Hatcher much in movies. Uh, I think she's mostly TV. It took her like over 100 episodes, but she made it to the contrarians. This is where we see the reveal where Kurt Russell was wearing a bulletproof vest. What are we going to do with it? We're going to take it off and we're going to get a shirtless Kurt Russell walking into the office because it's the 80s. Kurt Russell's hot as shit. And yeah, we want to see him without his shirt on. 
and it gives insight to the character uh, of Cash as well because he walks in the office without a shirt on. Someone's walking by with a box of pizza. Mm-hmm. He just grabs a slice for himself and wanders over to his desk. I mean, how could you not want to be friends with this guy? It's pretty clever how they plant the idea that there was something wrong with his gun <laughs> when it first happened because he pulled his gun out and he's like, somebody's been fucking with my gun. I'm like, all right, that's just like another little bit of characterization that this guy's very particular about his gun. But it comes into play later in the movie. As fun-loving and as uh, irreverent as this a Stang on Cash the movie is, it actually, it's pretty well constructed. It pays attention to details. I don't think that it gets enough credit for that. It doesn't show you something just to be uh, purposely misleading or a red herring or anything like that. It shows you something with a purpose. It's basically, you know, it's showing you the bricks they're going to use to set up a bridge 30 minutes from now. It's like Back to the Future. Like everything you see in 1985 is going to come into play when you go down to 1950. It's a thinker, that's for sure. The thinking man's action movie. He goes and interrogates the uh, attempted assassin that was at his apartment. He gets some information about a big shipment coming in. Because despite the fact that Tango and Cash have not yet met each other, we've established that they're the two you know, all-star cops on the LAPD. They're the best cops in town. And their you know, mission statement, despite their different, vastly different approaches, is to crack down on crime, stop, you know, these drug deals coming into town and, you know, make L.A. a a prosperous, gorgeous city to live in and a place they can be proud of. Um, So Russell's after, you know, whoever sent this man, uh, this assassin lets him know of a big deal that's going down later tonight. Just so happens that Tango Stallone gets wind of this as well. So he's going to be on the case for that. Meanwhile, Uh, Jack Palance, Parrot, explains to his, I wouldn't say minions, but the men that work for him, the the members of the crime, respective crime families around L.A. that work for him. Here's the plan. We're going to get Tango and Cash locked up for 18 months. And during that time, you know, we're just going to run roughshod. We're going to take over this place. It's the inverse of Harvey Dent's plan in The Dark Knight. That's two Dark Knight references already in this episode where he's going to have everyone arrested for 18 months so he can clean up the city <laughs> these guys are going to frame the cops so they can you know just overtake it it's a it's such a brilliant plan what's because they could kill them but instead they choose to frame them and have them arrested because what's worse than death going to prison go to court and go to prison yeah to deal with the inconvenience of it all so they set up this ruse this shipment coming in is an entire it's just a lie it's a, a facade. I used that word incorrectly earlier, so I can redeem myself there. Uh, this leads to like the meet cute though of Tango and Cash both at the scene. Uh, they run into each other with their you know their guns drawn and do the whole "I would have had you, no, you wouldn't." <laughs> and you know, right away we see the bickering between the two. We get the awesome exchange of uh, "Oh, I hear you're the second best cop in town," and then Kurt Russell says, "Funny, I hear the same thing about you." They're at each other's throats right away. It's the it's the beginning of a beautiful relationship. It's Shrek and Donkey. So they pursue together, and they go and they find that this has been a setup. It was they've been hoodwinked, bamboozled. The wool was pulled over their eyes as they find. Was this a law enforcement officer that was killed? Yes, because th- that's why okay. that's why they got in trouble. <laughs> if it had been somebody else. If it had just been Joe Schmo, they would have been all right. The situation is there's a wire on this cop who had been killed. The FBI swarm in. They apprehend both Tango and Cash. At the scene, the previously featured gun of Cash is at the scene, giving, you know, it's a literal interpretation to the expression, don't introduce a gun in the first act (laughs) if you're not going to pay it off in the third, which, I mean, the compliment to hear that you can give to the writing team of uh, Feldman and uh, the director Andre is that they rush that they introduce a gun in the first act and then five minutes later they pay it off they have no time for the third act there, there are bigger <laughs> bigger and better things coming down the line in the third act I, I don't even I would just argue this movie is one long first act <laughs> <laughs> we are we're currently living the third act of Tango and Cash <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the postmodern interpretation of Tango and Cash. The first act is the adventures of Tango and Cash. And the third act is how people in the year 2021 interpret those adventures. The FBI come in, they arrest Tango and Cash, they hold them, you know, under investigation. And it's a a whole conspiracy here. They've been set up to make it look like they were um, 
buying drugs and there was a cash flow situation and then they killed this cop that they were working with, so to speak. And then there's the introduction of the deep fakes. There were the audio tapes that were doctored <laughs> with obviously someone who knew how to do some decent sound editing went through and edited all these words together. It's like you and me sometimes on our podcast where we have to edit out the middle of sentences to make things mash together better. This guy's a much better editor than you or I, though. Uh, in that he didn't even have a computer. <laughs> I, I, exactly. He was just, he was literally just doing the, the slices of like the tape recordings, the film and whatnot. So God bless him. He put that together. And in the year 1988, it was never even prophesized that you could fake something like that. So everyone just hears these audio tapes and like guilty. Like th- <laughs> there was missing here as we go into the montage of uh, the different newspapers and the trial that they're going through and all of the people, you know, condemning them and. It's a, it's a rough go they have of it. We should have just gotten at least one shot of the jury with all of them just staring at Tango and Cash <laughs> shaking their heads. The entire trial process is not kind to them. I think I made this this comparison or kind of raised a similar point when we watch Hudson Hawk, which, by the way, is a movie that has, even though it's a 90s movie, I think it shares a lot of the, the carefree, let's just have fun spirit of Tango and Cash, but, uh, which makes sense then that that would have said something like this, which is that... Uh, this movie felt like a Looney Tunes cartoon come alive, you know, the live action adaptation of and it hit me when when we started getting the newspapers, you know, like the constant the shots of the headlines. <laughs> Tango and Cash arrested. Tango and Cash go on trial. Tango and Cash guilty? It's like when you're watching some of those shorts, some of those Looney Tunes shorts and they have the the spinning newspapers and then <laughs> you get the big headline uh for, yes, for, for joke. Exactly. Uh it's a lost art, I guess, like many of the things that happen in this movie, uh, to be able to be so silly, but still keep your movie from completely going into parody. You know, it's 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 still an action movie. <laughs> you know, it's not it's not a, a mockery of an action movie, but it has a lot of silliness that you know it's there to to get our tell you to relax and have fun you could tell the story and be dead serious about it and i mean it would still work right the, the idea of uh, two super cops being sent to prison that's i mean that works whether you play it for laughs or you play it uh for uh, as a full drama or somewhere in between like you do here but but more than likely you're gonna see it played as a more serious thing so i was I welcome all the silly, funny Looney Tunes stuff that happens uh, throughout the movie. And then we get our closing arguments from the two of them. Or not even closing arguments, it's just the closing statements. What do you boys have to say for yourselves? Tango is really eloquent. It's like, well, if you guys think we did this, I guess we must have. And then, you know, Kurt Russell stands up and he's just like, ah, this is fucking bullshit. And the whole place, like, goes crazy. (laughs) That's the one, like... uh, aspect of this they did not really flush out or shine any light on was that it seemed that the LAPD also thought they were set up and didn't do this but no one will hear from their fellow cops or take any type of like character statement or anything like that it's obvious and I say that like almost with a facetious tone because it's clear that Jack Palance is connected everywhere Mm -hmm. Parrot you know buys off everybody so even if every cop got on the stand and said they saw them not do it, it wouldn't have mattered. The court proceedings are a farce in every sense of the word. Something else that that, that this movie is, Alex, is a, it's a time capsule, which we've done a few of those. I mean, like I said at the beginning, oh, you yeah. know, it's like it's an 80s movie, and sometimes that's really all, the, all you have to say for somebody to understand. <laughs> you know? It's like, it's an 80s movie. Uh, in this case, in this particular scene, like the trial sequence, it was just uh, the dichotomy between what i was watching and you know in the year 2021 i was just like man that's uh, this is why movies exist <laughs> to remind us of uh, more innocent times where you could put this on a screen and just show two cops actually going to prison and it wouldn't be funny you'd actually believe it like it was like oh yeah that kind of thing <laughs> happens watching it in the year 2021 it was like unintentional comedy so the deal they make is they're gonna find you guilty one way or the other so you can I don't know if they got the um, West Memphis Three thing where they had a plea bargain while maintaining, like confessing to a crime while maintaining their innocence or whatever that weird legality is. But basically, their deal was, all right, we'll go with this, and but we get 18 months in this minimum security facility. Kurt Russell mentions there's a golf course there. Well, unfortunately for them, this goes awry as they're like literally apprehended 
by another vehicle on their transportation to this facility and are taken to prison prison <laughs> they're taken to you know <laughs> what's the line in office space of federal pound me in the ass penitentiary they're taken to jail jail they're like will arnett and will forte in that movie they go to prison <laughs> let's go to prison <laughs> oh and they get there and it's not unlike rorschach arriving with all the people that he helped put away. They're not long for this world as they get in. And it's also incredibly unsafe, even by prison standards in eighties movies. Cause there's just roaring fires going on all around the place. And they're walking through a riot. Yeah. And the cops aren't doing shit. They're like security guards at the UFC. <laughs> it's the ending of uh, natural born killers. Yeah, exactly. And so, they get to their respective cells. Uh, Cash has a, a large burly gentleman uh, fl- of uh, flatulence and uh, territory. Fortunately for us, the audience, maybe not for Tango himself, but Tango's cellmate is fucking Clint Howard, <laughs> who's portrayed as a murderer in this. Slinky is his name. And he's fucking crazy, but it's Clint Howard. So I'm sorry, I understand the subject material here is kind of rough, but I couldn't help but smile when Clint came on the screen. Prison movies, in general, they're just unpleasant experiences to sit through. Uh, And so I'm glad that they pitched this at a level where it was fun, you know? And how do you do that? Well, you cast Clint Howard as one of the as one of the roommates, one of the cellmates, and then you kind of diffuse the tension a little bit. He's still, I mean, it's Clint Howard, but he also looks, you know, there's different variations to Clint Howard. And in this case, I mean, I could buy that he had murdered people. He's Oh yeah, absolutely. Have you ever heard of the Ice Cream Man? <laughs> or the Ice Cream Man? It's a horror movie with Clint Howard where he's an ice cream man that kills people. No. Sounds amazing. Okay. Is it directed this, by Ron uh, Howard? This, <laughs> <laughs> he narrates it actually. <laughs> uh so I imagine this is kind of like like the Marvel Cinematic Universe. This is within the same uh, canon. So he was the ice cream man that you know was in prison for his crimes in this. Even though the timetables of the two movies don't match up at all, that movie had a budget of two million dollars. My God, a million went to Clint Howard. I was about to say we could be here all day talking about Clint Howard, but if nothing else, it gave the movie a sense of dignity that it didn't have already, having Clint Howard appear. <laughs> and I think he's not really played for. You know, he's giving it his all, and what he's doing isn't necessarily played for laughs, but it comes across as kind of funny because it's so awkward. He's got his slinky that he's playing with, and it exists to keep the audience on their toes. Well, if they were on their toes or on the edge of their seats, you know, that's only because Clint Howard enabled them to do so after being, you know, melted into their chairs. Because I got a little bit ahead of ourselves here. We do get a shower scene with both Tango and Cash, double man ass. And then just these long shots of them, you know, we don't get any full frontal action, but this is definitely, this would have been some uh, sought after material back in the day. I imagine, you know, we talked about with Titanic, the little, the marks people would have on where to rewind to, to see uh, Kate Winslet's uh, breasts. I bet there were a lot of young ladies that had this marked as uh, to where to go to see Sly and Kurt Russell backing it up. And the young gentlemen. I mean, this is... Oh, absolutely. Not to discriminate. Absolutely. I, I, I think that this scene knew what it was doing on, you know, for everybody. Because they're there flexing and there's a little bit of a friendly flirtation going on and then friendly ribbing. And just overall, nobody questions, like, and I'm talking about the audience, like, nobody would question the the weirdness of these two guys getting to take a private shower for two in that prison that was like a fucking nightmare because what we're getting out of it is just so rewarding and i'm not just talking about the the nudity and the the aesthetic part of it but also you i think that that's how you take your bond between characters to the next level right they were kind of hunting down criminals together they got arrested together they went to trial together the next step is showering together and cracking jokes about each other's genitals that's how you you increase not just attention, but also the, the friendship between them. They're dudes being dudes. And that's, you know, what this has come to. And it show, it serves a purpose of, you know, furthering their relationship. You don't get much closer with a dude than when you see his dong for the first time. It's something that stays with you and obviously with the two of them. And you comment on and it. That's, that's the key Exactly. Part. Yeah. 
you you have to observe it long enough to where you have a quip about it. That's that's <laughs> rule number one about seeing your best friend's junk. So the beginning of the movie comes back to pay off a little bit here as they call him Face in the movie, but uh, Robert Zadar, the gentleman with the overgrown jaw, is on a quest to take out Tango because he put him there. At night, these two men are put into laundry sacks and dumped down the laundry chute to the catacombs of this prison, wherever the fuck they are. And they're met there by a bunch of uh, very disgruntled inmates. But also we get Jack Palance here, Parrot, who comes out and explains, you know, I'm I'm the one who did this. And they're just still kind of like, who the fuck is that? We don't know who this guy is. <laughs> Again, they never really figure out he's the crime lord of Southern California. They just kind of follow the lead. They pull up the thread on the sweater until it unravels and until the end of the movie. They know it's Jack Palance. That's enough. <laughs> that's That's enough. They're like, well, you know. Worst case scenario, we have to kill him. Best case scenario, we get to like hang out with him and hear stories from him. So I can just imagine actually if they didn't even know that, and then uh, the next year they watch Batman '89 and they're like, "Holy shit, that's the guy!" <laughs> Palance, uh, Parrot, and Face, and then we were talking about Brian James a little bit earlier of Blade Runner fame, the ponytail man in this, the. Man, one of the great archetypes of a bad guy or henchman in late 80s, early 90s film that unfortunately has gone the way of the dodo. And that is the ponytailed bad guy. I mean, that's just it's such a great touch. And it's so I guess you can blame that fucker Steven Seagal for kind of (laughs) bogarting that in terms of, you know, making because he always had to be the hero taking away the devilishness of it all. But they show up, they start just beating the shit out of these two. The plan is they're going to electrocute them. They set up this like medieval type dunk tank where they're going to dunk them into these like washing stations, but they have these electric wires that have been frayed. So they put them in and they start to sizzle. And, you know, um, both men do the convulsing kind of with the <laughs> action it, that you come to expect from like a Daniel Stern. But in this case, it's <laughs> well, you it's, never see their skeletons, but it is refreshing to see both of them be able to take themselves out of the equation, not take themselves too seriously and kind of play it up here. But it's also, I mean, you see concern, I think maybe for the first time in the movie on Tango's side, when, because cash is the one that goes first and they, they torture him first. And that's their, lowering him into the into the water Stallone looks like he cares like he's truly worried about this guy that you know 20 minutes ago he kind of hated so that was cool you know I'm telling you that that shower set things up <laughs> character building baby they care about each other it's like I saw his penis now I care not gonna get much closer than that looks bad but the assistant warden Matt comes in I couldn't like the way they Sly kept saying Max. I thought he was saying Max and not Matt. So I had to look up what the character's name was. But he knows uh, Cash. They used to work together. So he comes in to rescue him and he tells, I have the quote written down here. You got only one choice, escape. He knows how dangerous that prison is. He's like, you fuckers got to get out of here or else you're going to get killed. I can only protect you for so long. So that immediately becomes the focus for Cash, whereas Tango is very apprehensive to the idea, which is right. He's like, if the fucking warden or assistant warden knows that, then everyone else is going to know that. So they could just be waiting for us. And Kurt Russell thinks about it for about half a second. He's like, nah, I'm still going to go for it. Uh, Wouldn't you know, it goes awry when he tries to escape. He finds that his buddy Matt was murdered by the guards and some of the prison gang after him. And Tango has to come and rescue him here. Again, he he didn't have to, but he chose to do it. Well, I think he realized he is even more fucked in there without him. Because at least <laughs> then he has someone that they can kind of like do the back-to-back fighting action. If he's just no, in Alex, there by himself. He realized he was going to miss him. <laughs> is that the angle here? They're, they're, they need each other. They're the end to each other's yang. Dude, the end of the movie is a close-up of their hands holding each other. <laughs> I mean... Well, you might be onto something here. I mean, I'm not, I'm not saying that there's anything sexual. I'm just saying that they, the heart. No, were neither am I. I'm just, yeah, or like life partner type thing. Like some people uh, are just kind of meant to be your Buzz and Woody type <laughs> exactly. thing. They can't exist without each other. I'm sure that by now, Woody and, and Buzz have taken showers together. They made jokes about their <laughs> lack of genitalia. Fig baths. Yeah, get, calling each other Ken, making jokes of that nature. 
Uh, the score really intensifies during this. The do, 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 do. You know, we talked about the RoboCop video games and, you know, the kind of the action games of that era. Mm-hmm. It feels very, you know, uh, arcade score. It's all, which is good. Uh, that's a that's a compliment for me. I was thinking uh, Double Dragon. Like from the moment that the that we had the, the scene where it's just the two of them against a hundred prisoners in the laundry room. That was that felt very Double Dragon to me. And then once again, once they were kind of in the middle of their escape, that still felt like Double Dragon, but this was more like a, I guess Double Dragon Two, which is more of a platformer, which is a lot of like jumping around going on. Fantastic. The aesthetic, they fit like the aesthetic of a video game that probably hadn't even been invented yet, but they, they nailed it ahead of time. So now they have to escape. They, they're running for their lives. They get to the roof. Russell hatches this plan where we got belts, which you wouldn't have in prison, but whatever. And they have, uh, they're going to latch onto a power line and kind of rappel down. It looks like a lot of fun. <laughs> it's like a zip line type thing. <laughs> so he goes first. He gets to the other side. He gets to freedom. I mean... Could it be more obvious where Shawshank Redemption stole this scene from? It's pouring down rain on the outside when they get, you know, out when they escape prison. Come on. Yeah, what uh, what Shawshank Redemption was missing was uh, a pretty awesome boss fight between Tim Robbins and, I don't know, the warden. Because here you get <laughs> yes. Stallone versus... Uh, face. Versus face. Uh, and it's pretty epic. Like, the guy has even, like, the weapon. He has a hook. Oh, yeah, it's great. Yeah, he's got this, like, batarang. Or not, he's got the bat hook is basically what <laughs> he pulls him down with and hooks it up. And it's pouring down rain, and they're next to, like, the electrical generators of the fucking prison. And Sly fights his way out and kicks him back. And this dude just roasts. He hits it. He's holding metal. It's wet. He's grabbing the wires while his feet are grounded. It's, it's, not, it's not a pretty sight. I do applaud this movie, though, for having the restraint to not show him, like, burnt to a crisp or not show, you know, uh, like the Lost Boys where the dude's head exploded from being electrocuted. <laughs> this movie is tasteful. Even with, like, you know, the nudity we were talking about earlier, we just kind of get a taste of it. And here, you know, the violence isn't over the top or gratuitous. I, I applaud uh, Andre for showing some restraint here. Maybe he was used to that coming from the home country, but we appreciate it here in America all the same. <laughs> well, and especially because he could have done it, and it still would have worked in the movie. Again, we're talking about, like, the tail end of the 80s. Like, anything goes. So if you show me face, you know, convulsing, electrocuting, and then exploding, I'll be like, sure, why not? I mean, at this point, I'm all in. And it, it, this movie has been just... It, it has me under its spell. Now, I don't remember. Does Stallone have enough, I guess, energy left to quip when this happens? When he defeats Face? Shit, I don't remember either. I, I didn't write it down <laughs> if he had, like, a one-liner or anything. But he... The because I remember the main thing I took note of here is when he does his zip line, he clearly takes the fall. I'm not sure if he did all his own stunts in this movie, but he clearly takes the fall from when he's supposed to get off the line uh, into like the dirt or whatever they had set up over there. And it was a decent fall. He took a good bump coming off of it, and that was kind of like the main thing I took note of because the way it was shot and this was before also like CGI and shit. There was no way they could have faked it. So that that is what I took stock of here. I'm gonna assume that he said something like I don't know. Instead of goodbye, he said good fry, or I don't know, something. Chomp on that. Chomp on that. <laughs> well, Tango and Cash have both escaped, and Parrot learns of this. And this, my note specifically calls out here, this is Jack Palance's Oscar scene. Uh, and he's, like, talking to a video wall that has um, Quan and Lopez on the other side of it. It's, you know, the FaceTime of its day. And they're clearly freaked out because they know they're coming for vengeance. And I can't remember the exact circumstance, but one of them says, I must insist. And Palance just yells at the TV, don't insist. And he (laughs) says, I'll tell you what to do and I'll tell you when to get worried. And he's holding a rat the whole time, kind of coddling it. Yes. Turns to Brian James and tells him kind of take care of it. Like I said, it really seems like Jack Palance had a good time making this. That was his rat. He brought it to set. (laughs) Yes. He wanted to introduce it to the cast. (laughs) I would say we still have like, I don't know, half the movie to go. And I've already, like, it already threw me a curveball because I thought that we were in for a prison movie, and which I was perfectly fine with. But now they're out of prison. Did you know that that was going to happen? Or did you also think that it was, that we were in for 90 minutes of, of them in prison? Yeah, I kind of expected more of a prison movie, but it, 
I appreciate that this movie kind of gives you, you know, the expression is the best of both worlds. This gives you the best of all worlds as it comes to, you know, the the cop genre because there's the initial chase, there's the, you know, framed officer, there's the time in prison, there's the revenge story. It it's all there. You got the the big blowout at the end. It's good stuff. Tango and Cash go to pick up the pieces of where things were in court. Tango goes to visit the uh, FBI officer that arrested them and, you know, um, slapped them with the, the formal charges. He says, you know, it doesn't matter. You can kill me if you want. My life is, you know, I'm on borrowed time as it is. And he goes to run away from Sly and runs into his garage. And um, it's implied he gets in his car and his car blows up. So he was very... Um, on the nose with that claim that he was on borrowed time. <laughs> well, here I did write down the quip from this scene or one of the quips in the scene because <laughs> Stallone says something about how he uh, he looks like he's been uh, he hasn't been eating much or something, and then he points his gun at this guy and says, "You need iron in your diet." God bless. The Oscar for best screenwriting goes to <laughs> Cash goes and pays the sound guy a visit. Starts destroying his equipment, which he maintains as top of the line. Points the gun at him. You know, he keeps declaring his innocence. I don't know. I don't know. I was just told to do it and send it to this address. And so he eventually hands over the tape where he was asked to do what he did and provides the address of where he was told to send it, which is the address of uh, Brian James Requin, the, uh, the ponytailed bad guy. So they split at prison to go their own separate ways to kind of figure things out. Right. And Tango asked Cash to go check on Kiki at the uh, dance club that she dances at. So he goes in and she's fortunately very uh, intuitive. She sees, you know, this guy down there that she's seen on the news with uh, her brother, we find out, and uh, sees the cops coming in and knows that it's bad news bears. So she brings him backstage um, and starts to plan like some escape route for him and says, we can't go out the back. You know, there'll be cops everywhere out there. We get one of the more noodle scratching scenes in the movie (laughs) because there's this guy who's about Kurt Russell's height and he says, Hey, what size are you? And he's wearing like this Elvis jumpsuit. And then, so we see that jumpsuit walking out and we find out that it's Terry Hatcher. She's under the helmet for it. And then out comes Kurt Russell and drag. And it's like, he's still just Kurt Russell. He's got like a five o'clock shadow (laughs) and these people like buy it. And this cop like asks him out. It's, it's quite something to take in. I can just see though, the movie theater audiences at Christmas, 1989, just having a, a roarous time watching this all unfold. But it's also, I think a pretty clever commentary on just the biases of, uh, not just the police, but I imagine, uh, People in general, America in general, in the 80s, in the late 80s, where you would rather, you know, you you can't fathom, you can't reconcile the idea of Kurt Russell, action hero, in drag, you know, or in in the world of of the movie, you know, you can't reconcile the idea of Gabriel Cash, super cop, in drag, that's just like unheard of. In the late 80s, yeah, it's impossible. There's no yeah. way. It, it, it's not mainstream enough for that to happen. There's no way. So they just assume that that's not him and then let him go. I mean, it, it, on top of that, his instincts were right because the cops stopped Terry Hatcher when she comes out dressed as Elvis with the with the helmet. So they think, you know, they would have stopped Kurt Russell if he had just come out with the helmet and dressed like Elvis. So on one, end, on one hand, it was the right move. And also it happened to say a lot about the just the state of America in the 80s when it came to, uh, I guess, men dressing as women. Just can't compute at that time. Yeah, I would say that it was a bold decision on Kurt Russell's part because exactly what you're saying, not – nearly as widely accepted as it is now and also something that would have been heavily mocked back then so even for something that's like a quick laugh here it's something that i think definitely took a lot of courage on his end to do and the Uh, oscar goes to i mean (laughs) they gave an oscar to eddie redmayne so why not (laughs) they escape with no issue they actually flick their cigarettes in unison it's pretty cool and they go back to casa de tango and this is where we find out that uh, Kiki and Ray Tango, that they're brother and sister. We get your classic uh, like Austin Powers esque. Um, Three's company. That's that's always my go to. 
Three's Company. Austin Powers is what I was raised on in terms of that type of comedy where uh, it's like the vantage point where you're seeing it's wrong, so you're misinterpreting it. Because Terry Hatcher is giving Kurt Russell a massage and the way they're speaking about it and stuff sounds very sexual. It sounds like they're engaging in premarital intercourse. So Sylvester Stallone comes in and he's going to take them out because he's furious about it. But then he sees the LAPD captain at the door. So goes and tackles him first to see you know what the fuck's going on. 30 minutes worth of exposition here in 30 seconds. So you got to pay attention as to what's going on because we learned the the bombshell about the brother-sister relationship, which watching this for the first time as both you and I did, Julio, in preparation for this, it made a lot more sense at that point. But even like the the scene of are they having sex? I thought like, what the fuck? <laughs> Kurt Russell's trying to move in on uh, <laughs> Sylvester Stallone's girlfriend in this. What's going on? But so, but, but we knew that they weren't having sex. Actually, they they it was it was pretty cool because they have this conversation while she's giving him a, a giving Kurt Russell a massage where Kurt Russell thinks that they are together. Right? Doesn't she say? He asks her, "What's your relationship?" And she says, "Well, you know, I love him, and he loves me too, and blah blah blah." And and you can see they, there's a close up of Kurt Russell's face, or you can see him making the decision. Okay, the line has been drawn. I'm not gonna go there. That sucks, but okay, this is just yeah. a massage. It's not until he finds out that they're brother and sister then then, then he goes, "Oh, that's great, man. <laughs> I'm in." What they learn from this aside, the interpersonal relationships at hand is they've got 24 hours to get this shit sorted out and uh, taken care of because that's what the captain says. Uh, captain Schroeder, he only has you know X amount of energy that he can keep them uh, keep the police force at bay with. So they're on the case. They immediately go to the address that was provided to them by the sound guy. And as I mentioned before, this is Requin's apartment, Brian James. They get into not even a shootout, just an interaction with them. They take him uh, hostage, I guess you would say, and they try to extract the information from him by hanging him off the side of the building, a la Suge Knight and Vanilla Ice. But to no avail, he really just couldn't be bothered. He says in a terrible British slash Australian accent, the view from here is nice. He he says bollocks and mate, and basically he just, I don't know if he listened to like three Beatles interviews and was like, I've got this, I can handle it. The backstory of that character, which sadly ended up in the cutting room floor, it was fascinating. Just how he'd been raised in England and in Australia. His change in accent reflects his his inner conflict, his inner turmoil. I'm sure that the Blu-ray has uh, uh, all those deleted scenes where they explain his accent and his accent changes. The detailed comedy. Well, what I was thinking in this scene was, <laughs> yes. crikey, this is a bunch of bollocks. <laughs> They trick him into giving all the information he has, though, as they strap a grenade to his mouth. It's actually pretty metal what they do. They, like, duct tape a grenade inside his mouth, and Stallone threatens to pull a pin, and Kurt Russell does this whole thing. If you're out of your mind, he says something like, if you wanted my award for the biggest psycho, you've got it. <laughs> did you buy it? At least did they trick you? Or did you, did you think that it was all a big act? Yeah, I thought at this point they had become close enough with each other and understand each other's understood each other enough and their methods to now become this like tag team where they knew each other's beats. So when they said, you know, ah, gotcha. I was like, hell yeah, you did. (laughs) And they said it was all part of their act. uh, Bad cop, worse cop. Yeah. You're, you're more in tune with your 80 sensibilities because they, I thought that we were actually seeing a little bit of a falling out because I, you know, for better or for worse, I kept trying to apply 2021 logic to it, which is not the way to watch, this movie, this movie again, it's a celebration of '80s. So, if this movie was made today, you would have the scene towards the the turn towards the third act where they have a falling out, where the uptight character of uh, Jay Tango finally comes. He just unravels the the pressure of everything that's been happening in the movie. Just gets to him and he snaps. And now he's he's a maniac. He's so out of control that the crazy cop, the cop played by Kurt Russell. You know, now has to become the responsible cop and rein him in. But that's that's modern storytelling, and you know it has its place. But its place is not a movie like Tango and Cash. So I'm glad that instead it was a it was a gotcha moment where you were like, "Hey, we were in control the entire time, and and the bad guys suck." Bad cop, worst cop. <laughs> And then drops the grenade down his pants and it says nat- natural birth control, but it's just a dud. <laughs> and then they have a little bit of bantering about uh about Tango's sister. 
You know, as you do, as one does. Cash is buddies with the R&D guy for the LAPD, played by Michael J. Pollard. His introductory scene, he's got like that magnifying lens on his eye. It's He's clearly just a... I guess this is kind of an archetype also, or a cliched character, the crazy old man that's good at building weaponry. I, I, I don't know if that's still as prevalent today as it was. Well, now he's played by Morgan Freeman. There you go, Lucius. Yep. Yeah, that's what he told um, Cash. When you're done with my SUV, type in your name. <laughs> but he gives them all these crazy weapons he's been working on. Of course, things that haven't been approved for the force yet. One of which is this, like tank. This, uh, it's just a souped up SUV, but it has guns on it and a bunch of armor and battering ram type shit. So. They're just going to go for the fortress. They know where to get uh, Parrot now, so they're going in guns a blazing. And that they do. They don't really. I think for a little bit they try to be stealth about it, but then eventually it's like the two ways you can play Metal Gear Solid. You can actually take your time and stealth <laughs> through it or just go in guns blazing and kill everybody. Yeah. Uh, One way is a lot harder, but it's a lot more fun. Well, I think that they, they did their due diligence. They leveled up enough that it wasn't going to be that hard to really just barrel through all the way to the to the final boss. Uh, I did appreciate that we got one final quiet moment between the two where they they just sit down and discuss what they're going to do about Terry Hatcher's future. Where they decide if she's, if she's going to be allowed to date Kurt Russell or not. And they have a, a pretty solid back and forth where they kind of examine their relationship, how close they become as friends, and whether that bears any weight on Terry Hatcher's romantic future. You know, took me back to the days before woke culture decided that that it was not PC for an older brother to decide who his sister was going to date. <laughs> it was a more innocent time, the 80s. So after this moment of tranquility and uh, a remembrance of when it used to be better, <laughs> they head into the mouth of the beast they just go in, as I mentioned, guns blazing. It's absolute chaos. Jack Palance is watching from like a monitor in his office, and he's just having such a great time watching all of this unfold. Eventually, Tango and Cash fight their way through uh, the first and second and third and fourth lines of defense until they actually get to the fortress. They have Sister Tango. <laughs> Kiki is being held captive. I don't know how. I guess they just swooped in at the right time. After they, I don't know how or why they would have left her alone, but they did, I guess, just for the right amount of time. Anyway, she's held at gunpoint now. Twice. Once they actually, <laughs> twice. Once Tango and Cash actually breach the lair, or whatever the fuck you want to call it, the office of Parrot, it becomes a shootout, and Quan does not make it long. It made me sad to see Chris Sanders' dad just... He, like, basically pulls out a gun, and then Kurt Russell immediately sees him and just lights him up. Same thing goes for Lopez. He's the one that gets a shot off on Kurt Russell, though. Shoots him in the hand, but there's really not much to it. He just turns around and ices him. We get a one last appearance here by Requin, who runs in, and he actually... Get, it pays off the grenade gag, right? This is where he mm-hmm. gets blown up. The, the payoffs just come in, come at you fast and strong in these final 10 minutes because there's there's the payoff of the grenade and then there's the payoff of the countdown uh when they're fighting jack palance yeah explain that one to me because i kind of got confused here about how they kill palance uh, well there's a, there's a couple of things going on so so after they dispose of ponytail man it's just jack palance uh holding kiki at gunpoint but he is in some sort of fun house where there's like a whole bunch of mirrors so you don't know who's the real Jack Palance. And they say, okay, at the count of three, we shoot him in the knees. And then as a callback to the first time when they first met, when Kurt Russell and, and Stallone first met in the movie, where uh, they were going to run into a room in the count of three, and then Kurt Russell like, went in when they were like at two, <laughs> just to, to get there before Stallone. Like Here they do the same. They count three, two, and then they shoot before the countdown is is over which is that was a great callback but then on top of that they showed that they're smart because they knew that they were shooting at the right at jack palance another reflection uh but each of them figured out a different way kerr russell saw that the monogram on his shirt was was backwards so that meant that that was a, a reflection so he knew which one which way which way to shoot and then uh, uh okay uh stallone 
realized that the watch, his watch was on the opposite arm. So that meant that that was a reflection. But they both nail him, like they shoot him in the head. And then they quip about how they were both aiming, they were still aiming for the knees. So overall, a great time. <laughs> because I, okay. I took a solid like five minutes to explain it. And the movie gives it to you in 30 seconds. <laughs> well, I'm glad that I have such a literate, podcasting partner that could break it down for me that quickly (laughs) then they escape and the whole facility is going to fucking blow it wouldn't be a classic 80s movie if we didn't have the whole bleep 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 countdown waiting for someone to get the fuck out of dodge so the three of them take off they head for cover they watch the place explode and then they kind of have the the last moments of uh reflection where uh isn't this where he says i'm still gonna date your sister and terry hatcher just kind of smiles at him (laughs) yes she smiles a lot in this final moment, uh, in these final moments of the movie, because they, they keep going back and forth as they've been doing the entire film. Uh, Kurt Russell and, and Stallone, they just can't stop needling each other because he says, well, I guess I've earned the right to date your sister. And then Stallone says, over my dead body. And Kurt Russell says, OK. And the entire time, Trey Hatcher is just smiling at him, looking at Russell like he's the greatest thing ever, which he is in this movie, in Nexus Alone. But it pays off, though, because this is twice in the movie they went to high five and were cut off or they hesitated or, you know, just it didn't feel like the right moment. So this we actually get the the climactic high five. And this is where the movie transitions from them high fiving to them holding each other's arms up in victory. <laughs> And the cover of the newspaper where they're heroes again. They've come back triumphant and vanquished the evil and overcome the corrupt system that is the American judicial system. Did you see the the headline next to to their big headline proclaiming their innocence? Mickey Rooney dead at 93. (laughs) No, it says, uh, ask not what the critics say. As if you needed more proof that this movie knew exactly what it was doing. And he was having a grand old time doing it, too. Did it really say that? Yep. Sometimes you, you'll hit me with those, and you're so good at your delivery, I believe you. That- no, Alex. I, I I mean, I'm sure you could probably like Google it, Google image it, and it'll show up. But if not, it's free on Tubi. So just fast forward all the way to the end. And uh- <laughs> God bless. A movie, yeah. I think you're exactly right, a movie that knew exactly what it was. There is a moment much earlier uh, that also that gave me the same feeling, the giddy feeling of like, oh, we're in good hands, and that's when uh, the it's the lone's chief, his his commanding officer or whatever is, is telling him, why do you do this? You don't need it, you know. You're always dressed up. You need the money. Why do you do it? And uh, I wrote it down. Uh, Stallone says, you know, he's like, well, I just like the excitement, and then he says, good old American action, and then he walks away. <laughs> Good old American action. His captain also tells him at one point, if you just want to look death in the eyes, why don't you get married? And then he said, is that a proposal? This movie was written by Aaron Sorkin's dad. At Sorkin. (laughs) (laughs) All right. Well, this movie is a bit of a jumbled mess uh, in terms of its production. So I think we should move along to that and also to see how each other felt about it, Julio. So let's uh, take this baby on to Real Talk. I didn't believe all that weird sadistic bullshit I heard you pull, but you are, man. You're for real! If you don't want to get sticky, get back. Jack. Dun, 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 dun. You got it, sicko. You blew it big time, pal. This asshole's out of control, and I can't stop him. But I'm not going down for this tango. I mean it. You're on your own. I'm out of here. Don't forget the right. You are my vote for the Psycho Hall of Fame, asshole. You got it. You really do look like shit in a ponytail. No. no I'm sorry. Bye, bye, baby. Bye, baby. I don't want to hear it. Perret! The Gigi you want Perret! He's Perret! Who the hell is Perret? The bloke with me in prison. He's the governor. Yeah, where's he now? Where's the governor? The desert, right go after you. Think he's telling the truth? I don't know. But it's not raining, and he's standing in a puddle. Mm, disgusting. You know, Potato Head, you just fell for the oldest routine in the book. Bad cop? Worst cop. <laughs> and we are back, ready for real talk. But before we go into real talk, we're going to do PP, our patron pitch. This is a segment where if you're a patron, you get to hear about what awaits you on our patron channel. And if you're not a patron, maybe this segment will convince you to become a patron. And speaking of becoming a patron, we have a new patron, Mark Frodsham. Welcome to the Contrarian Supplements family. Yes. Yes. 
they keep coming, Alex. If you build it, they will come. That's what they said, and they were right. <laughs> so Mark and all of our other patrons, they have access to a whole bunch of goodies. Uh, we have the cutting room floor segment, which is where we put all the stuff that doesn't make it into the episode. Uh, we also have Contrarians After Hours, which is where we tell you about stuff that we've watched. Sometimes we recommend it. Sometimes we just kind of want to talk about it. Uh, we also have a, a tier where you get to pick what we do on the show. Case in point, Jamie Russell, who said, guys, you are going to do Tango and Cash. Well, actually, like we explained in the first segment, he said, you can do one of these movies, and we picked Tango and Cash. But anyway, mm -hmm. thank you, Jamie. Jamie also, because it's a, on a very specific tier, he has also picked a movie for us to do exclusively for patrons. Uh, we're going to be doing The King of Comedy. In fact, depending on when this episode drops, you might have already gotten the King of Comedy episode. Uh, so lots of good stuff happening uh, on our Patreon channel, patreon.com slash contrarian prime. Go there, check out our tiers. Uh, if any of them tickle your fancy, feel free to contribute. Absolutely. $1, $3, $5, and $10 tiers. For less than a bag of Haribo gummy bears, you can go over to the contrarians <laughs> and have access to much of our exclusive content. Be sure to check it out. Tell us how you feel about it. We actually got some feedback on our wrestler episode uh, that I'll be touching base on in uh, Contrarians After Hours. Kind of got some updates on some of the stuff we talked about there. But check it out. Let us know what you think. Let us know what you'd like to see from us. Uh, but as to each and every one of our patrons, greatly appreciated. Now, speaking of Contrarians After Hours, Alex, so, so I assumed that part of our After Hours segment this time was going to be you telling me about wrestlemania the highs the lows <laughs> i mean sure it it was a lot of fun i'm still recovering from that week and i kind of fell behind on my movie watching but yeah i can kind of give you the the elevator pitch for what wrestlemania 37 was uh as far as actual movies go i finished my nightmare on elm street franchise viewing so that was kind of like what i did as far as movies go last week, all I really had left was Freddy's dead. That was the one I had never seen. And Reed lent me his box set and I was going to see him on Sunday for WrestleMania. So I was like, well, I want to finish this so I can get it back to him. So give a quick recap of WrestleMania, provide a few updates on some feedback from a wrestler episode and talk about just basically a general overview of the nightmare on Elm street franchise, the high highs and mostly low lows. So, Julio, what do you have to discuss in Contrarians After Hours? Uh, well, um, still on the documentary kick this time, as, as I've been doing uh, the last couple times, one of the Academy Award-nominated docs, this time I went with The Mole Agent, which is from uh, Chile, I think. I'll double-check before we actually record the segment. But uh, it's a pretty cool, pretty short documentary about a senior citizen that goes undercover uh, into a nursing home uh, they, a, a private detective hires him to go undercover and kind of, you know, find out what's happening with one of the senior citizens that lives there. And uh, it's a pretty fascinating story. I can tell. I, I understand why it got nominated. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about it. See if you want to watch it. I think it's on Hulu right now. Uh, and also, part plug, part discussion. I recently guessed it on our friend Ryan's other podcasts, Ryan from Spit and Polish, he has a Star Trek Discovery podcast called Yum Yum, <laughs> which makes sense if you've excellent if you've watched the show. Yum Yum is it's a infamous line from season two. Um, he does that one with his wife, who's also a big Star Trek fan. Uh, his wife Rachel I got to meet her last week when we recorded, and the episode just posted. Like as we are recording today, the their episode is live. It's for episode four of season three called Forget Me Not. I mentioned it on the retweet. If if any of you have caught me and Ryan in one of our many Star Trek Discovery discussions online, either on Twitter on, or Instagram, uh, you might think that this, this guest spot on his Star Trek podcast was just me and him screaming at each other. But that's not the case. <laughs> it was actually a very civilized discussion about an episode that I... I Admit wasn't perfect, but I thought there was a lot of good in it. And uh, Ryan and his wife—they're pretty critical of the show. Uh, so mm -hmm. I, 
I thought that was gonna I was heading into a big fight, but instead it turned out to be just a very like I said a very civilized discussion. It's a, it was a really cool experience. So uh, check out Yum Yum <laughs> Yum Yum podcast. I will put the links in uh, that specific episode where I'm in. But what that leads me to is that in after hours, I will also tell you a little bit more about Star Trek Discovery, which I think I might have mentioned to you a couple of times, but I, I finally finished the third season having seen all the Star Trek Discovery material that's out there so far. Uh, I think that I have a pretty good idea of how I feel about the show. Uh, mm. Especially reminded me a little bit of something you said about Ozark, which, by the way, I'm still making my way through that. But how you said that, you know, you felt that season three kind of elevated the show. Yeah. And I, I, that's how I feel about season three of Discovery. So talk a little bit about that, too. So there's, there's a packed segment, a packed after hour segment. A whopper lineup. Yep. And now we can go to Real Talk. All right. Real Talk for Tango and Cash. Patron requested, patron demanded episode. Again, as I stated in the first portion, released Christmas time, 89, December 22nd, 1989. Uh, directed by Andre Konchalovsky. As we'll talk about, that is kind of debated. I mean, he was there for most of it, but uh, was taken out towards the end. Seems like this movie was went through the ringer with the studio, which was Warner Brothers. Written by Randy Feldman. Uh, Jeffrey Bohm came in to do some rewrites. I'm pretty sure Sly did some rewrites as well. Um, the man behind Rocky. What else are you going to have him around for? Come on. <laughs> you have an Academy Award winner as, as a member of your cast, and you need rewrites? Come on. <laughs> uh, starring Sylvester Stallone, Kurt Russell, Jack Palance. Budget of approximately $54 million with a box office return of slightly over $120 million. So, again, did well. Uh, not received well with a 30% uh, rating on Rotten Tomatoes. Was nominated for several Golden Raspberries, including Worst Screenplay, Worst Actor. Who was the Worst Actor? Uh, Sly was nominated for you it. You don't say. And then the <laughs> Razzies were cute about it, and they nominated uh, Kurt Russell for Worst Supporting Actress because he was in <laughs> drag in this movie. It did not win any of those awards. It was, uh, I feel like we have talked about this year before many moons ago, because this was also the year that Star Trek V, The Final Frontier, was oh, man. Uh, the f- front runner. So they tie them together here. I need my pain. <laughs> you beat me to it. <laughs> Don't insist. <laughs> Uh, an interesting movie. I tried to go into it fairly blind, not completely back rail blind, but fairly just because uh, I hadn't seen it before and I just kind of want to have some fun with it, w- which it is a fun movie. But it sounds like a very quick uh, bottled version of the issues with it where some people wanted to make a more serious movie and Warner Brothers wanted wanted a really dumb, simple buddy cop movie that people could go see and point and laugh at. Um, looks like there was a bunch of rewrites during it for characters to have certain lines. The whole Requind and face characters didn't really have any lines in the original script, but they went back through and added those. Um, the director uh, was replaced towards the end of principal photography by Albert uh, Magnoli of Purple Rain fame. Uh, in his memoirs, Konchalovsky... The director says that the reason he was fired was because he wanted to give the film a more serious tone than the producers wanted, and in such, his relationship with John Peters became untenable. Uh, he had nothing but praise, but so uh, had nothing but praise for Sylvester Stallone, though, and stated he was the constant voice of reason on set. Oh imagine, <laughs> <laughs> imagine. He was so he he got so in character that he was Jay Tango. He was a uh, the uptight. Cop and Kurt Russell was probably the one that was instigating all the conflict. <laughs> yes. But you won't hit him. That's what he <laughs> kept saying. I dare you to fire the director. I fucking dare you. A total of four different people directed the film. We had Konchalovsky, who was fired after th- more than three months. Uh, Stallone, after the movie went over budget and uh, schedule. Executive producer Peter McDonald, who was also the second unit director, then took over directing the movie for some time. He worked with Stallone on Rambo 3. 
And then uh, who I just mentioned, Albert Magnoli, was hired as the new director to finish it. But even after principal photography was finished, he caused two more weeks of further delays after he decided to reshoot some parts of the movie. Uh, and Stallone was also still directing behind the scenes. So can you tell from watching this movie that it went through that much pr- production hell? Or do you just think this is kind of a lazy movie? Uh, I couldn't tell. And honestly, my main takeaway is that, uh, you know, granted, it was a different time, but th- there was no like hashtag release the Kuchelovsky cut movement or anything, you know, <laughs> like fucking people took it like adults. It's like, okay, we got this movie moving on. <laughs> there is not like years of people just clamoring for the, the definitive cut of Tango and Cash. And, and there was no HBO to pick it up and just let uh, this Russian guy just it's because there's no internet man yeah the great thing about the internet it gives everyone a voice the awful thing about the internet it gives everyone a voice i think maybe there were a couple of uh of stallone fans that maybe wrote letters like strongly worded letters to warner brothers (laughs) hey every one of them started hey yo (laughs) (laughs) the the warner brothers executives like what's a hashtag uh yeah that's a that's a excellent point that you started off with is that it's exactly that that People just took it for what it was and said, all right, time to move on. Um, Julio, I feel it's appropriate to ask you this question. Do you know what other movie Sylvester Stallone and Kurt Russell co-starred in? Oh, fuck, there was more than one? <laughs> Is there a Tang on Cash sequel I'm not aware of? Um, well, I mean, Sly has in recent years oh, I know this. I know said this. that he I would like this. to make Stop, them. stop, stop. You're trying to be clever. I was still in 80s mode. <laughs> <laughs> I was, yeah, no, I, I almost brought it up in Contreras Corner where I couldn't find a way of doing it. Yeah, Guardians of the Galaxy 2, which you haven't even seen. No, I just, I saw the connection between the two and I was like, I hope I can stump this fucker and then I can be like, <laughs> oh, some MCU fan you are. No, they don't even share a scene. I mean, they're you know, in completely different parts of the galaxy. But still, nice try, man. Nice try. <laughs> Let's see who else was considered for Gabriel Cash. Michael Bain, hell yeah. Ray Liotta, Liam Neeson, Gary Oldman, Robert Patrick, Bill Paxton, Ron Perlman, Dennis Quaid, Gary Sinise, Bruce Willis, James Wood, Pierce Brosnan, Kevin Costner, Harrison Ford, Richard Gere, Mel Gibson, Don Johnson, Michael Keaton. Uh, At one point, there was a rumor that Arnold was going to play, Schwarzenegger was going to play Cash. Imagine how unintelligible the dialogue exchanges would have been at that point. Uh. So, are, so you're telling me that there was, uh, like, there were plenty of options for cash, but there was never any argument about Stallone being Tango? I'm pretty sure that was the entire idea. Again, I didn't do my as much research as I do sometimes for this, but it seems like it was always going to be a Stallone vehicle. Um, Jack Palance said he uh, did not like the movie. When he was promoting it, or I guess a couple years after the fact, actually, on uh, The Tonight Show, he said when he first got the script, he was just excited about working with Sylvester Stallone because their two characters had some scenes in it. But after everything got bungled and everything, uh, they didn't really have any scenes at all in it. So to answer your question, it was going to be, yeah, Stallone movie. And then to my point, when I watched this, I was like, man, Jack Palance is having a fucking blast. And then I read that (laughs) afterwards. I was like, oh, He's just a really good actor. <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> All right, Julio. We've set the table, so let's move on into it. And, you know, we covered this in the first portion. We've mentioned it again here in Real Talk. But 30% of Rotten Tomatoes, a little bit higher uh, than what we usually do. Um you know, we've had it all the way down to 0% before. So uh, 30% is looking good in some cases. <laughs> but And that does mean there was a fair amount of positive reviews for it. And obviously, it made a fucking $120 million, so some people liked it. What uh, what were the positive reviews saying? All right, so I got a handful of fresh quotes from the Rotten Tomatoes website. We're going to open with with somebody who's, who's part of the Contrarian's family by now. Ken Hankey from Mountain Express, Asheville, yes. North Carolina. He says, worth it for Jack Palance's over-the-top villainy. So he must have loved Batman 89. I agree. Uh, Peter Canavese from Groucho Reviews says, a bizarrely appealing movie. Tango and Cash is the essence of camp. It's bad and knows it's bad. So therefore, it's good? He has a question mark at the end. Uh, we can't escape the definitions of camp. <laughs> 
<laughs> in this case, we cannot. it's bad, and it knows it's bad. Uh, Nigel Floyd from Time Out says, What makes this shoot him up nonsense surprisingly watchable is Randy Feldman's rapid-fire dialogue, which constantly undercuts the mashup posturings while parodying Stallone's screen image. I would say it parodies both, right? Stallone and Kurt Russell. I mean, from what I know or what I perceive as uh, Kurt Russell's 80s persona. Hot. (laughs) Yes, that too. Uh, Finally, Phil Villarreal from Arizona Daily Star. Stallone has just enough moxie to make this watchable. Russell isn't so bad either. And I picked this one as the closer because I found it puzzling. Alex, in am I missing something? Is is Sylvester Stallone good in this movie? That's like my main like the crux of my experience watching Tango and Cash. Whether I think it's a good movie or a bad movie, Stallone is not good in it, <laughs> right? Tell me I'm right. Oh yeah, it's definitely when he was still finding his footing as an actor and you know, wondering how much he was willing to give. It seems like in this discussion, especially around WrestleMania time, we can't escape this. But Sly, man, he was like a pro wrestler in the sense of like old school style in the sense of there after Rocky got really big, you know, not sure how much I'm going to sell and not sure how compromised I want to look in some movies. And, you know, I'm not sure if I want to be the butt of too many jokes. Uh, so it seems like he's trying to walk that line in this at the same time, trying to do some like kind of almost serious performance. Whereas it seems like, seems like this movie was read two different ways. And Andre, the original director and Sly read it as like something that was going to be kind of a more serious cop thriller. Uh, you know, maybe akin to like Copland or something that Sly would eventually oh, go Jesus. on to do where he did, well, I was about to say that's an example too of something where he did let himself be a victim or be willing to give, and that movie's fucking incredible, and he's mm-hmm. great in it. Uh, whereas the other side of this, like the production studio and the directors that came in later, um, what was Homeboy's name, uh, Magnoli, and Kurt Russell specifically got the idea of this being this popcorn fun movie. Kurt Russell's awesome in this, and I like the, I when agree. you read that quote, I was like. Uh, did Julio, you know, minor touch of dyslexia there? Did he read the names backwards? Because that <laughs> yep. should have been, yeah. That was my thought. It, it, it was, but but the fact that I don't know, it was just so boldly, confidently expressed, made me wonder if that is the, if that's the consensus that this is uh, a good uh, Sylvester Stallone performance, and that Kurt Russell is okay too. I would hope because to me, it's the opposite. Yeah, it's um, you know, just kind of while you were going over those quotes too, just reading some of these things about how the movie was bungled and fumbled. Uh, it went over budget by $20 million, which I don't, I don't know how, I mean, I do know how, if they're constantly reshooting all those fucking explosions and shit back in the days of real practical effects. Uh, and then kind of backing up what I had said there, one of the quotes I had earmarked for this was, Stallone gave his opinion on Kanchalovsky and Magnoli and said, Andre was a real gentleman, and I thought his take on Tango and Cash was very good and would have been infinitely more realistic had he been allowed to continue. His replacement was more attuned to comic pop culture, so the film had a dramatic shift into a more lighthearted direction. So just cards on the table. I had a good time watching this. Went on a little bit too long. Sly is a little heavy handed for such a silly movie, but I had a pretty good time. And I can tell you from that, that this movie would have been, could have approached like showgirls territory. If they tried to do some sort of like serious presentation of it, maybe not that bad, but you know what I mean? Of like, if you tried to treat this movie in like any type of serious light with the players you had and the action sequences that you had, the difference between this and Copland is Copland has an, a god tier cast this does not so if you try to make some like serious movie with this where you're asking in many cases polished actors to do these like dramatic monologues it could have gotten very sticky very fast and then especially terry hatcher gorgeous and went on to become quite the polished actress herself but she was still wet behind the ears here so even with the minimal dialogue she has it's still kind of like child actor-ish of oh dude this. i thought she was better than Stallone. 
<laughs> this is my line. Well, she's better than that because she she's better than Stallone in this because she exudes enthusiasm and mm-hmm. like she really genuinely seems excited to be there and even like her dance scenes and shit, you can kind of read behind her eyes of her thinking, man, this is my break here. And she probably made a good amount of money for it and got her name out there. But Stallone, yeah. Stallone's the asshole in this that's like treating it like an Oscar movie when everyone else is just having a good time. <laughs> but not even, you know, I, I mean, I guess so. But not, he's not I, even good. Yeah, I, I think the problem is that he's not funny. He's, I mean, th- there are times where he's just funny because he's a victim of circumstances, right? When everything else comes together even his performance can't make it unfunny but but his line delivery is just not good and i don't know well, he that figured I've ever that seen... out you know that's why like a lot of the rambo movies and shit with the one liners he there's no one there that can play off of him so that you just have to accept he's good by default <laughs> instead of here where he's just in a constant like a uh, ping pong match with kurt russell and it's just and kurt russell <laughs> is infinitely more charming and good at pulling off quips yep Yep. Uh, I mean, even before they they meet for the first time, just that opening sequence when he's just trying to to be you know quippy on his own with it just doesn't work. He doesn't have the delivery. I don't know if he if he got the delivery later in in later movies. I don't think I've seen any Stallone comedies. I don't think I've seen him be funny in anything. You know, it's um. I guess in the Expendables, he kind of has a sense of humor about himself. Well. The, the Expendables is a weird case study because it's like the second one is good because they re- they lifted all restraints and feelings of we still have to treat this somewhat seriously. But what I was going to say was to your kind of where you were going, uh, Rocky Balboa is the one. It's a perfect storm because he's such a down and down in the dumps kind of guy. And, you know, his life is kind of just veered off this path. That his kind of almost like mopey one liners kind of work in the sense of you kind of laugh, but at the same time, you really feel bad for Rocky in that movie. It's a pity laugh. (laughs) Kind of. He got better as an actor for sure, but I think a lot of the cases where it worked for him, it was just a series of circumstances really paying dividends. Uh, Here again, yeah, it's. I couldn't even really compare it to anything because that first scene with him and Terry Hatcher in his office where, yeah, he's like, I don't know what the fuck he's trying to do. (laughs) Like when he's got the phone and he's don't go. That's not a word you love. It was just so weird. He just doesn't have the rhythm for, for, for comedy. There you go. That's like, and it's one of those things if it's so hypnotizing in, it's not like it's flat out bad. Like, you know, something you would watch and just be like, God, this is terrible. It's more just captivating. Cause it's like, what, what, is the plan, Phil? Like, what? What's? What was the idea behind this? It's not Elizabeth Berkeley and Showgirls, and I hate to bring that back up, but you know, it's fresh on our minds. But like, there was no point in this where I laughed at how bad Sly was. It was more just me wondering who thought it was okay to tell him to do comedy. Like, yeah, but you know, now that you say that, the only reason you're not thinking of it as like, oh man, this is a terrible performance, is because you have. Uh, Stallone's persona attached to it. Good call. If you didn't know this guy from anything, you know, if this was just some random dude that you're watching give this performance, it would be just, it would be even worse. It, you wouldn't be able to stand it because Very true. it's just bad, you know, but because it's Stallone, then you're just mystified. I mean, I was mystified from the get go, you know, the, the way that he was dressed, the way that, you know, his glasses and the way that he was, I, I could see what he was trying to do, even though it wasn't working. I was like, oh, it's its interesting because it's Stallone, but yeah, it's not, it doesn't work. Yeah, and then you put him against Kurt Russell and it's just the kiss of death. Um, that said, I mean, because I haven't said it yet, I, I did have a good time. I mean, it was, uh, good. it was just a dumb action movie that, I, I can't imagine anybody taking it seriously and then complaining that you know it was it was too silly. I think that I, I said in Contrary's Corner, the movie tells you what kind of movie it is really early on and it stays consistently silly. Honestly, I mean I know I joked about it in Contrary's Corner, but I can't imagine a serious version of this having been shot and then reshoots turning it into this movie. I guess it's possible, and that would explain why they spent so much more money but you know what i mean it's the the script the the way that they talk the things that happen they're just so over the top silly that i don't know how 
like with the footage that we have here, if I had to reshoot it to make it a serious movie, I would have to reshoot, I don't know, 70% of the movie. <laughs> oh, yeah. Basically, all the every uh, every time that Stallone and uh, Kurt Russell are on screen. So, I mean, I guess that could have happened, you know, not to go back to, to Snyder Cut jokes, but that's allegedly, the, the deal was that Joss Whedon reshot like 70% of the movie. So, I guess it could happen. Would I watch that movie? I mean... I don't know. I, I think that I would have a harder time watching a serious movie, a, a serious Tango and Cash, even if that meant that Stallone would be more at home, because I think that that would dim Kurt Russell too much, maybe. Yeah. I, I mean, this movie succeeds and is likely memorable because of Kurt Russell and Sly for his being Sly. Uh, but yeah, anything more serious than it is right now, the the parts you have to this just it's not going to work. It's going to come across as something really, truly bad. Whereas this is still, I mean, even, you know, I love eighties fun action movies and shit like that. Uh, this is kind of the stuff I, I call these the Saturday matinees. Like, like some of the comments we got when you posted that this is what we're doing, like watching him like, all right, it's not that bad. Uh, it's, uh, <laughs> it's perfectly, it's a perfect, cromulent movie, perfectly cromulent movie. And it is what it is. I mean, Stallone, this would have been Rocky V territory. Rocky V came out the next year. That was the one that kind of tanked everything. Uh, Rocky IV. Yeah, Rocky IV was a few years before this. So he was still riding high off that wind. And his being, you could almost probably attribute this to the beginning of that, the downfall of Stallone in terms of being that marquee action hero because this came out and then Rocky five, which fucking sucked. And then, I mean, I know people love judge dread now and God, I remember the intense amounts of marketing and, um, over the top energy that was gone into making that movie a thing in the mid nineties. But it, I don't think it set the world on fire when it came out. I still haven't seen it. It's fine. But I can only imagine, you know, to see Stallone pale in comparison to Kurt Russell, how much worse does it get when you have him next to Rob Schneider? <laughs> well, and to put into hindsight, too, that this this definitely could attribute to kind of the beginning of the, the fall because there came Rocky Five, and then Oscar and then Stop or My Mom Will Shoot. With, okay, uh, so he, he just, he was determined to make a comedy. <laughs> <laughs> it was going to happen one way or the other. And he said, uh, you know, I got this fucking Ruski and it didn't work out. So now I'm going to go with John Landis and see what he can do for me. It's like uh, Robert De Niro in the early 2000s. Like, I'm done with Aww. all the dramas. Just want to be funny. I don't know. I don't know how what the options were for Sylvester Stallone as far as, you know, take your pick of comedies. And then what do you do if you're a director? You, you said it was John Landis who directed him and, and what, who Oscar? directed Oscar. Yeah. Yeah. How do you handle that? You know, Sylvester Stallone comes to you and he's like, I want to do a comedy. <laughs> um, okay. <laughs> Hold on my calls, please. <laughs> we got to figure this out. Yeah. And I, I think that's something he eventually realized too, that his money is in being what people first came to know him as, is Rocky Balboa and fucking John Rambo. I think that's crucial for some actors to realize at some point in time and that sucks and that's why some people step away from the game but in this particular extreme example of Sylvester Stallone that's what people want to see and we've talked about I mean De Niro just as one we came up and we've talked about other like comedic actors or dramatic actors I've never once in my life wanted to see Daniel Day-Lewis do a pratfall <laughs> <laughs> I've never been interested in seeing Daniel and Meryl Streep like slip on a banana peel. It just does not appeal to me. But that is something that as actors, sometimes they kind of want to see if they can scratch that itch. And I think that's something that uh, Stallone definitely struggled with throughout the 90s and early 2000s was trying to figure out who am I? Where, where do I fit in? And that dude made a shit ton of money during that time, too. So I'm not trying to shame him for any of this. It's just it's the nature of the beast. And this is kind of an example of that. And he's lucky he had all the other parts we're talking about. Jack Palance, uh, Cassandra's dad even being in the background with some of these like extremely over-the-top 
stereotypical Asian dialect and like uh, mannerisms and whatnot. Terry Hatcher even and her just like kind of infectious enthusiasm for being on the project. He's lucky he had all that because th- it made this movie a decent time. Uh, like I said, I had fun with it. So Sly, I think we need to ease up on him. He's kind of turned us <laughs> turn the corner. He's come back around on things. Moving along to the other parts of the movie here, or do you have something to put on? The, no, no, no. I was going to say since, since we're moving off of Sly, it, I want to spend a little more time on on his counterpart, the part that arguably Cash works best. Yes, Cash. What's your your Kurt Russell experience? Because I was surprised that it's in my case, it's actually fairly limited. I always forget that he was a child actor. I, I didn't even know that. Yeah. Yeah, he started when he was like I read a little bit earlier. He started when he was twelve in that movie with. Elvis and then did some movies through his early teens. Uh he was he's been active in acting since fucking 1963. Um Kurt Russell's just like one of those guys that you almost in my particular situation you almost just take for granted. He's mm-hmm. always been there. He's always been good in whatever's called of him. Um God, my dad loves Stargate. So anytime Kurt Russell comes up, that's some of the things I think of. I remember Backdraft as a kid was uh, a big one. I remember crying watching that as a little kid. I haven't seen that movie in years, but I it probably is not as good as I remember it being when I was that young. Escape from L.A. I'm just kind of going down here. I do not remember him in Vanilla Sky. Oh yeah, he's the he's the psychologist psychiatrist that Tom Cruise is talking to. Death Proof, and then of course, up until recently with Bone Tomahawk, and you know how much I fucking love that movie. That mm-hmm. that's not, felt almost like a culmination of a lot of things for him. But yeah, I think the best way to describe my relationship with him as a, a movie viewer is I've just taken him for granted because he's reliable. When you say yours is fairly limited, just meaning the amount of movies you've seen with him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, mm-hmm. I, I, but it's funny because I, I had the feeling that I'd seen more, but really no. I mean, I just. Just recently, we were talking on Patreon about how I just got around to watching Tombstone, which is one of those iconic, well-known Kurt Russell movies. I feel like I've seen him in most of his two thousands stuff, but none of the none of the classic like eighties, nineties things. You know, I, I've seen Escape from New York, and even that, I, I I came to it pretty late. And I guess I've seen the thing. So yeah, that's, that's two of his big Carpenter ones. Um, He's uh he's in Sky High, which I liked quite a bit. <laughs> uh, How's this course, for something fucking crazy? He did the voice of Copper in Fox and the Hound. Multi talented Kurt Russell. I really liked him. It, it well, so here's what's crazy, and and the reason I brought it up is that not really being super familiar with Kurt Russell's filmography, just being aware of his persona, mostly from you know trailers clips just the overall pop culture sense of it when i was watching tango and cash i was like this is pure kurt russell <laughs> you know like i said in control's corner yeah. i felt that sly was playing against type but kurt russell was just just upping up the kurt russellness dialing it up to 11 and uh, and it works you know it was to me it's like this is when you get A kurt russell perfect your movie, movie for that kind of performance yep Yep, but but it also makes perfect sense, right? You you cast Kurt Russell because you wanted this exactly. You didn't cast him so that he could give an Oscar winning performance or surprise his critics or whatever, uh, or rebrand himself. No, you you cast him because this is exactly what you wanted from a Kurt Russell performance in the eighties. This is what what brought people to watch Kurt Russell movies, and mm-hmm. uh, it just felt right <laughs> in in the way that the the Stallone performance felt wrong. And I guess that helps the movie, you know, it gives a balance. And I guess on a, on a very meta uh, aspect of it, it it highlights the differences in their characters, even though it's the performances are not intentionally that different, I think. But uh, it just adds that extra layer, right? The, the character of Jay Tango is being played by an actor that's nowhere near as comfortable playing that character as the actor that's playing uh, somebody who's completely different. It, uh, Gabriel Cash. So that's kind yeah. of interesting in, in a very behind the scenes kind of way. But yeah, I, I I think he's great. And honestly, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing that he doesn't have a, a, a Rocky to point to, you know, because I think in a way that gives him more flexibility. Yeah. But like at even, the same time, I mean, you know, he doesn't have a Rocky. 
I was about to say, even Tom Hanks, you have some, like, you have Big or Forrest Gump or something you can point to uh, for someone who's as versatile as him. Mm-hmm. And I think, yeah, that that's an interesting discussion to have because they're obviously diehard Kurt Russell fans, but because of the things we're just mentioning here, I think it's why it's easy to sometimes forget or sleep on or like I said take for granted Kurt Russell and then you see something like this or in my case recently Bone Tomahawk you're like holy shit Kurt Russell is good at what he does and (laughs) this movie specifically to your point with that whole 80s flair around it because he was like he was up there with like Swayze and uh, Val Kilmer and like hunks of that time and they all brought a certain I would say different type of dynamism to the whole idea of the hunk. Obviously, Swayze was a bit more of the uh, romance guy, and then, you know, Val Kilmer, kind of a bit more of the artsy fartsy. And then, you know, <laughs> you have Kurt Russell here, who just is like an everyman. He, you know, he defines that whole uh, thing and the old analogy about baby faces and wrestlers the best ones are the the ones that uh, women want to sleep with and the guys want to have a beer with. And that's him in this movie. And he, much like I said, Terry Hatcher is infectious just because of her raw enthusiasm. Kurt Russell is infectious in this just because he's nailing what's asked of him, and it makes you as an audience member being able to like be more comfortable with the movie and the absurdity of it all. Whereas Sly almost completely cancels that out. Yeah. Do you think now that you've given me all the the scoop on the the original director being fired, do you think that opening gag? In the uh, with Kurt Russell's introduction, the whole like, uh, I believe in Perestroika, and then Russell is like, "Welcome to America, pal," or whatever he says. <laughs> do you think that's the original I cut? Forgot about that. Or do that, you think that would that's, be that's a reshoot, a mean spirited reshoot? That'd be such great petty bullshit if yep. that was like, ah, fuck you. <laughs> we we live here now. We take over. <laughs> I don't know. That would be interesting to try to do some research and ask some questions from people about that. It certainly would be, I would take within the wheelhouse of possibility just because, you know, especially back in the days of before you could go online and say these people bullied me or did something like that. You know, there was a lot more mean spirited shit like that going on. Uh, Or Andre is just having a chuckle at his home country's (laughs) expense. You never know. It felt, I'd be more inclined to believe it was added in there because it just felt so unnecessary (laughs) so out of nowhere this is the only rushing in the movie yeah um so i think it's very complimentary what you and i both agreed upon already that this movie apparently went through production hell and so many different fingers in the pie type thing and it didn't really come across as that the issues we had with it we've stated so far even the story is not too flimsy it's just a dumb action movie uh it's really just the sly factor so I would say that is uh, a positive thing in the movie that you can't really tell that it was production hell. Uh, and also, like I said, I thought Jack Palance was having fun. And so the fact that he came out and said he wasn't is funny and a testament to how good he is. What did you think of him as the bad guy in this? He was fine. He, he's definitely having a good time. But I also I think the fact that he's mostly behind a bunch of computer screens or TV screens, not really interacting with people that limits how much fun we can have with his character. Good so I, I mean, I was happy to see him, but I'd be lying if I said that I wasn't bummed that he didn't get to do more as far as, you know, do something. <laughs> he has that awesome moment with the rat, which yeah. I was, I was very happy you brought it up because I'd forgotten. I didn't write it down and then I, I forgot, but He's good. He just, because it's Jack Palance, I, I really wanted more. You know, I've seen Jack Palance have fun. I've seen City Slickers. Yeah. So <laughs> he can, you can make him a bigger part of the movie. I think that the reason, I was just thinking about this as you were reading it, but the, the reason that you, maybe you don't see the, that all the reshoots are not as apparent is because of the type of movie that ended up being, where it just seems like the movie is not taking itself so seriously. So it's a lot easier to forgive any kind of like weirdness that maybe would be a lot more noticeable if you had the the more serious take on it, if you were playing it straight. I know as I was watching it, there were a couple of things that made me go like, huh? But it's also, you know, I knew what kind of movie I was watching. So I'm like, it doesn't matter. Just keep going. I imagine if you had a more serious movie, maybe this was part of the original cut, the 
the way that they get set up would make more sense. Jack Palance's big plot doesn't really make sense in a serious movie. Mm -hmm. Um, It's like, it's cool because it's fun. I want to see these guys get stuck in jail for, imprisoned for 18 months. And I want to see them face their enemies and all that stuff. But why not just kill them? You know, it's like, they, they even bring it up in the movie. But I don't think I didn't feel like there was ever a satisfactory answer as to why he wouldn't just kill them. <laughs> he never even has that that classic excuse of like if we kill them, they become martyrs, they become symbols. <laughs> no, <laughs> I mean he was planning to kill them in prison anyway. <laughs> so it's like a Doctor Evil thing of like, why don't we just kill him? And then these guards come and shoot the guy that said that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, and it was never really established that Jack Palance maybe wanted them to suffer. And that's why, you know, like you saw that he was frustrated with them, but it didn't really feel like the whole point of this was to make them suffer. Uh, So it doesn't matter because the movie that you end up watching is that kind of movie where it it makes no sense to question those things. You you know that there's a movie where Stallone was making fun of Rambo. It's that kind of movie. But in the original cut, I would imagine, I, I would think maybe you had a more cohesive plan. Maybe there was a serious reason why they needed to go to prison instead of being killed. Maybe you needed the reputation to be ruined so that all the cases that they had built up would no longer be solid from a legal standpoint. I don't know. But but I think that, I guess what I'm saying is that it benefits the movie in the end to end up with the tone it did when it comes to the reshoots. Because... It made it easier. Anything that doesn't make sense, anything that doesn't app, it just you're like, well, that's fine because it's it's this silly movie. It doesn't have to make sense. All that was missing is Warner Brothers saying, "Get us La Paglia." <laughs> uh, put it over La the top. Paglia to to replace the loan. I probably would have been better. No offense, Sly, just wasn't in the cards for you, baby. All right, so I had a good time. It, it is what it is. It's a fun 80s movie, uh, action movie. I say 80s. It was literally days before the new decade, so uh, I'll just I'll say it, 90s movie, fun buddy cop movie. Uh, Kurt Russell was good. I enjoyed Terry Hatcher's performance, Palance. Um, again, it's not what I would call a good movie, but I would have zero qualms about ever revisiting this, so I'm just going to go with a C plus for me. I think I'm, I'm giving it the equivalent to that. I'm going to give it two and a half stars. I, I had a good time. I I know that I would revisit it. I was, I was kind of tuning out towards the end. The, uh, the big... It is, it is so funny you say that because I was pretty enchanted by this movie. But as soon as it just turned into like the big action set piece at the end, it was the first time I really found myself on my phone. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because there is no longer... Uh, it felt like I'd seen that before. <laughs> yeah. There you the, go. The stuff with the with the prison was fun, and even after they get out, the you know them intimidating the the people that they're that they're going after that was kind of fun, and the interaction with Terry Hatcher. But then once they get into that fucking tank and they just go to town, that was just like generic action movie. I and to me it feels more eighties and nineties, but uh, just because it was more you know the R rated part of it felt like very eighties. So it's that plus the the Stallone performance was just. I couldn't help but feel that the movie would be so much better if you had somebody that was playing on the same level as Kurt yeah. Russell. And then it would be just it would just be funny and it would be because the problem is that as great as the quips are and as fun as it is to have two protagonists that are quipping, it's counterproductive when you have somebody who can't deliver because then it's just then they start dragging. You know, at some point I was just like, Can you guys stop talking? Because it's not working. <laughs> Let's just get through the to the next scene uh, so yeah two and a half for me it's still like a fun time but unlike you I don't know that I would revisit it I mean not by myself yeah I probably should have given an asterisk with that being like I have no problem putting this on with other people I doubt I'm going to sit down and watch this again alone so that was Tango and Cash per Jamie's demand one of our wonderful patrons so thank you for bringing that to the limelight uh, covering a blind spot for both Julio and myself now we can say we've seen this and we now have one more piece of Stallone's turn of the 90s puzzle in place. But a good time was had with Tango and Cash on deck next for episode 131 TBD. Julio and I are still going back and forth on what our next episode is going to be. We know it will be a rotten 
film coming off of 130 with Crash. Now, before we go into perennial plugs, uh, Alex, we are almost there. The live stream for The Cure is happening in less than a month. So uh, let's let's drop this promo once again, and then we'll go into a little bit more details about our segment. My name is Nicholas Haskins, and I'd like a moment of your time to tell you about the fifth annual live stream for The Cure. To do that, I brought along two people whom I couldn't do this event without, Gerald Morris and Dan Brennick. Over the past four years, the live stream for The Cure has raised over $30,000 for the Cancer Research Institute. That contribution is helping to fund research into cancer immunotherapy, training the body's immune system to fight all forms of cancer. This year, we're aiming for our biggest goal yet as we try to raise $15,000 in 50 hours on the air. Tune in May 19th through the 23rd as we're joined live by podcasters and content creators from around the world. With your help, we can continue the fight for a future immune to cancer. Together, we can make a difference. Life's in for the Cure 2021 edition. It runs from Wednesday, May 19th to Sunday, May 23rd. The Contrarians will be on on May 22nd at 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And as we've been teasing for several episodes now, we finally caught up, in a way, to real time. Somewhat. In the sense that, as we record this, the poll that we had put on Twitter is over. We have a clear winner as far as which director we're going to tackle on that Livestream for the Cure segment. Uh, It's going to be one M. Night Shyamalan. We're going to be doing a rotten Shyamalan movie. Uh, TBD, again. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> don't worry we'll announce it probably by next episode maybe yeah. the one after that but um there's only like two serious contenders we're just having a back and forth about it yes yeah yeah a, a big a big thing is just can we do it in an hour which one would be easier to do in an hour uh, while providing the most participation another thing to consider is which one would be most painful for nick to watch <laughs> so i'm, I'm kind of thinking that he's not familiar with any of the options so that'll also be fun and I think that he's going to watch him with Dan and, and uh, Gerald because he'll probably be there with him. So it's, there's going to be a lot of uh, fun torture to go around. So anyway, May 19th to May 23rd for the full live stream for The Cure for our segment in particular, May 22nd, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, a Rotten Shyamalan movie. Be ready. It'll be a lot of fun. And just check out all the segments that you can during the live stream. It's for a good cause. And... Uh, and it's it's really awesome to just have people there reacting live to uh to the stream. It's it's always a good time. It really is. Uh, Looking forward to it. So now, Alex, uh, let's move on to perennial plugs. Let's do. Let's start off by giving a thanks to the festive years who provide our opening and closing tracks. They kick us off with Last Stand, take us home with Summer of Ninety Nine. Be sure to head over to thefestiveyears.com for any and all Festive Years needs. Our friend Hans Rutgeser, we already name-dropped him earlier. Hans did our logo. He's done all the graphics on our webpage, on our upcoming merch. He's a great guy. He's a podcaster. He has a bunch of podcasts. He has Nación Combi, Marginal, and Contantisonante. The last two are uh, about Peruvian economy. The first one is about Peruvian current affairs. You can find him in any podcatchers. He's also an author. He has a bunch of zombie novels. His most recent novel is called Zomo Zombies, and it's a collection of short stories, each by a different Peruvian author, and each story takes place in the Peruvian region that the author is from. You can check Hans's work on his website, nildemonios.pe, M-I-L-D-E-M-O-N-I-O-S dot P-E. You can also contact him on Twitter at Mildemonios or email him at Mildemonios at hotmail.com. Thank you, Hans, for all your work. And Ms. Zoe Perez for all the work you do for us on our social media game. Uh, if you haven't already, be sure to go over to our Instagram account at Contrarian Prime. Give us a follow over there. Zoe helps us out with... A lot of pretty pictures, interactive videos, audio clips for y'all to uh, behold, as well as our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash Contrarian Prime. That, too, will get you all your Contrarian's goods. Zoe, we really appreciate the work you do for us. Keep it up. And with all that out of the way, that's going to do it for this episode of The Contrarians, where we're right and you're wrong, and we'll catch you next time. Bye.